storm of uh, we're moving around, but we're still in the same spot that that the Holy Spirit stays with us. Um, and he says that we have to know this so that we know the breadth and the depth of the love of God. Well, I don't know that we can, we can't obviously know that. I mean, it's beyond our comprehension. And with the Holy Spirit, we can understand more. I don't know if we understand all, but the Holy Spirit shows us the depth and the breadth and how, you know, how strong that love is for us. And we know that if you look at the other scriptures like John 3.16, that God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him has everlasting life. And that shows right there concretely that God loves us. And uh, loves us enough that he gave his son. And all of you, most of you have children, and we think about that and we go, our kids, I mean, and then I also was uh, thinking about Paul in Romans, his eight, what is it, 8, 38 and 39. Um, he says that he's convinced that uh, neither, let me find it, or I won't be able to. Um, says, for I am convinced neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So Paul is obviously convinced and knows. And he and obviously as he stated it in Romans, then he's already he's talked in this about Romans about knowing that love of God and that he's convinced that the love of God is there's no way to go, that it's always there, that nothing can separate us. But we can separate, we as people can separate from the Holy Spirit, even whether it's walking away and saying, I don't want to do this anymore, or whether it's just doing something that, you know, well, maybe I shouldn't have done that, you know, driving down the freeway too fast or something. I mean, you know, um, so that's the point I got of it, is the zebra part of it is that we know what we know in, in believing in God and the Holy Spirit. But we are supposed to keep. We are supposed to pray that the Holy Spirit will work in us, so we will continue and to know and learn more. So how to love about the love of God. And the thing I thought was interesting as an afterthought, and I have no idea where I'm at, at on time, is an afterthought. This letter was not Ephesians was not written to condemn or chastise or chide the Ephesians. They had actually. This is a pretty positive letter. It's it's encouragement and teaching, um, and you know it goes on after this passage in chapter four um, about the unity. And he talks in the prayer about we're all named Father, and then he goes to Christian unity. That um, I just lost my train of thought. Um, so he's using this as a, as a teaching tool, and that this is not something that he's being critical of us, he just something that he wants us to learn. Paul appear I mean, Ephesians appears to be more of a teaching encouragement, whereas he in a lot of the other epistles he's condemning and or criticizing or chastising, however you want to teach however you want to to phrase it, he's making them um, you know, change their ways. Whereas he's doing that in this, he's changing us he's he's asking us to change by praying but it's in a positive effect for our good, for uh, our obedience to the Holy Spirit and what we can learn. Okay. Uh, good. Any questions for Donna? Mm -hmm. So in one sentence, could you just tell me what you think the central point of 14 through 21 is? To know the depth and the breadth of the love of God. Okay. And how does that personally impact you? When, when you get through the passage and you're done, what do you personally come away with that you need to change that's different for you in your life? Or for um, anyone? In, when I did this, it personally came away with the fact that I have probably taken advantage of the Holy Spirit. And I, and I don't know if that's the correct wording, in that I just assume I ask Him for help, um, uh, a guide, but I don't always pray just for what Paul is speaking here, mm -hmm. to know the full love of what God gives us. Right. 
Good. Cool. Excellent. Yeah. Any other comments, questions from anyone? Good job, Donna. Yeah. 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 Jordan, you're up. Do you know who makes a lot of money? Pharmaceutical companies. <laughs> for some reason, people really like for their bodies to be working properly, especially if the thing that's screwing up could be fatal. People will spend hundreds or thousands of dollars trying to fix their bodies if they're broken. And, <clears throat> well, this begs the question, if we are, if we are Christ's body, then shouldn't we do every bit as much as we can? <coughs> every. Yeah. Try to drink. No, it's. I just yeah, I stumbled over my words there. Shouldn't we do every bit as much to, uh, to make the body of Christ as strong and healthy as it could be? Well, in this passage that I'm going to be going through, we talk a bit about how to do that. Um, but before we get into that, I'm just going to recap some of the stuff we've been through before. Um, you were dead in your trespasses and sin, but God made us alive together with Christ in the ages to come. Uh, he might, or, so that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Therefore, remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, were separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel. But now you have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one, so that you were no longer strangers and aliens but you are fellow citizens with the saints. Therefore I implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling which you have been called. There is one body and one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and one Father of all. But to each one of us was given, uh, to each one of us grace was given. As a result, we are no longer to be children, but speaking truth and love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, from whom the whole body, being fitted and held together, by what every joint supplies, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. So this I say, that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk, but you lay aside the old self and put on the new self, which is in the likeness of God, as has been created in the righteousness and holiness of the truth. And now the continuation. In 425, he says, Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth to each other, uh, speak truth, each one of you, with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Now, Paul here uses member slightly differently than, say, Costco would use the word member. <laughs> here, he's not talking about us being part of a, some club or anything. We are members of the same body. We are members of the body of Christ. In Colossians 3, Paul connects lying to, uh, connects lying to others to evil practices of the old self. Uh, he says, do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices. Lying serves a purpose for those outside the church to benefit uh, the self by deceiving others. But as Christians, we're part of something larger than ourselves, and these practices have no place in the new man. Now, this isn't a license to gossip or to insult people in the name of honesty. Uh, well, Paul has stuff to say about that, and James himself, well, James, the brother of Jesus, he had quite a bit to say on the use of the tongue in chapter 3 of his epistle, but um, for the sake of brevity, we're just going to do uh, chapter 1, verse 26. If anyone thinks himself to be religious, and yet does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. Now, of course, there is light, more to life as members of Christ's body than just speaking the truth in love, as essential as that is. Um, in verses 26 through 27, he says, Be angry, and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not give the devil an opportunity. Now, I checked, and the word here used for anger is the exact same one that Jesus used in the Sermon on the Mount when he said that uh, everyone who is angry with his 
brother shall be guilty before the court. So I'm not going to take Paul's statement as condoning anger in general. Um, you know, it's not a license to be angry uh, as long as we don't act on it. But, uh, but anger is a natural reaction to things that we don't approve of. And there are some things that we are, we are justified in being angry about. Um, even Jesus himself showed rage when he drove the, the uh, traitors out of the temple. But there is a distinction between what Paul says here and what Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, on the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, whoever is angry with his brother, whoever calls his brother fool or you no good or stuff like that. Here it's more be angry, but like I said, there are some things that we can be angry about. We can be angry at sin, but we do not hate the sinner. Um, and when Jesus tacked on that whoever is angry with his brother is guilty, he also said something else. He said, therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar and you remember that your brother has something against you, not, not that you are angry, but if your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar and go, first to be reconciled with your brother, and then come back and present your offering. So between Paul saying that we need to let this, <clears throat> between Paul saying that we should not let the sun go down on our anger, and Jesus saying to prioritize reconciliation with another who is angry at us, a church that obeys the Bible's teachings on anger, <clears throat> really should really should be dealing with these sorts of problems very quickly. Um, and considering how the body of Christ is made up, this is incredibly important. Human bodies, um, they tend to not like other body parts that come from the outside. Like, if I needed a heart transplant, you couldn't just put any heart inside my chest and expect it to work. These things, these, these body parts that come from different bodies, they don't always mesh very well. And when they don't mesh, uh, it can pretty much lead to the death of the body. Now, I'm not saying that the body of Christ is that frail, but it is a serious concern. It is serious when the body, when members of the body reject each other. Anyway, moving on to verse 28. Uh, so Paul has told us to speak the truth, and he said, be angry, but do not sin. And here he says, he who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with one who has need. As Paul succinctly uh, related to the elders of the church at Ephesus in Acts, it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. Paul gave us a look at a more negative perspective on this in his letter to Timothy. If anyone does not provide for his own, especially for those of his own household, he is denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. The old self was, wor <clears throat> the old self was concerned with building itself up, even at the expense of others. But as Christians, we are concerned with building up the body of Christ, the church. We aren't tumors concerned with our own cancerous growth to the detriment of the body. We are to work together to support the other parts. Um, anyway, moving on to verse 29. So he said, speak truth, uh, be angry, do not sin. He who steals must steal no longer. And here he says, let no unwholesome word, no rotten word, proceed from your mouth. But only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will be... <clears throat> so that it will give grace to those who hear. Now the word here for grace is charis, uh, which I mention here because I'm going to be bringing it up again just a bit, um, in just a bit. <clears throat> now the word charis means grace or goodwill or loving kindness or favor. So when we open our mouth to speak, our speech should be seasoned with grace, with goodwill towards our hearers and others. Um, again, we are to build each other up rather than tear each other down. And in case you haven't picked up on a running theme in this whole speech, um, verses 31 and 32 sum it up nicely. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. If we want the body of Christ to be strong and healthy, it comes down to two things. First, all forms of malice should be done away with. Remember how Charis relates to goodwill? 
Well, the word here for malice, uh, kekia, or kekia, blah, 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 uh, refers to ill will or desire to injure. Uh, if we want the body of Christ to be healthy and strong, all of these things, anger, gossip, bitterness, and anything else that falls under this general heading of malice, all of these should be done away with. Now, luckily, we aren't alone in this. As Paul said in Romans 6, um, all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death. Our old self was crucified with him in order that our body might <clears throat> in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. The old man has been put to, the old man has been put to death in Christ along with its evil practices. We have the Holy Spirit on our side working with us and we should have the support of each other as well. And that brings us that brings me to the second point namely that we are to love one another. Admittedly, Paul didn't use the word agape when he said that we should be kind, tender-hearted, and forgiving. But if we're being pedantic about which Greek words he did use, the word translated as forgiving is uh, cherizomai. Um, again, relating back to the word cheris. I'm pretty sure this is basically the verb form of that. It means to do good for others, and forgiving is a large part of that, but, well, I think the definition is broad enough that really any form of goodwill would fall under this commandment. And, you know, goodwill, love, I made a connection. So, to make a long story short, if you want Christ's body on earth to be strong and healthy, be gracious to one another, not malicious. Build each other up, don't tear each other down. Uh, work for the good of your brother, not for his ill. Uh, do unto others as you would have others do unto you. Uh, do not do unto those as you would not have others do unto you. In thought, in word, in deed. Love one another and do it proactively. Um, there's actually someone in my church, well, actually there are these two people in my church who, um, to give an example of this, they used to be friends, but a long time ago, several years ago, uh, something happened and their relationship broke. And for years, they've been attending the same church, but whenever they were in the same room, there would be this awkwardness that was kind of difficult to hide. And, um, well, just a couple months ago, someone else got involved. He was in the same room with these two people, and he noticed something. He noticed that there was this thing between them. So he approached each of them separately, and he talked to them in private about what was going on. And he'd made the effort to repair the relationship between them. We are to be proactive in building up the body. Um, now, like I said, this was only a few months ago. I don't know what the final outcome of all this is going to be. Um, but so far, I've seen growth in that area that has been dead for years. <clears throat> if we want the body of Christ to be strong and healthy, we are to do likewise. <clears throat> okay, before you take it off. Oh, right. <laughs> Any comments? Yeah. Okay, I have a question. How do you tie verse 30 into all of it? Because I noticed you left it out. So how does verse 30 fit into well, all of that? Verse 30 was kind of, I, I viewed it as a motive. You know, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. He's talking about all these different things you can do horribly. And I didn't want to get into a discussion about uh, how we grieve the Holy Spirit when we do all of this, when the you know, when I was mostly focusing on application. Um, but, you know, the Holy Spirit brought us together. He forms us into this body of Christ. You know, when we are baptized into the Holy Spirit, uh, we are brought into this one unified body. And this, well, really any kind of sin or rebellion is grieving the Holy Spirit, grieving God. But I think in this particular passage, Paul is talking about all of these different things we can do, uh, harming each other, breaking the body, as grieving the Holy Spirit. And like I said, it's, it's relevant, but I just didn't want to get into that when I was more focused on the application. I thought it was really relevant, so I'm glad I asked. Yeah, yeah. like I said, I, I'm not saying it's not relevant. No, I, I, just, I understand, yeah. You were focused on this one thing, but I, I was yeah. curious how you would type verse 30 and you that was good. I like that. Yeah, it just would have been kind of a distraction when I was kind of gearing up for the end. Okay. And I didn't want to lose momentum. 
So when you studied this, and you did a really good job, good analysis of the key words, and I, I liked your introduction. I thought that was a good way to draw us in to thinking about that, that comparing, you know, if, if you can make a profit from thinking people are getting healthy, you can certainly look at it in your own church. And I'm, I'm assuming you, you, when you drew your, your main illustration there at the end, a good illustration was from your personal experience, these people that you know at your church. Mm -hmm. But uh, as you kind of finished wrapping this up, uh, for you personally, what did you come away with thinking that I need to do something differently or more or stop doing something or focus for you personally? Um, mostly in building relationships with people that I, well, okay, one of those two people was me. So uh, the thing where I came away with was I need to work on repairing the relationship fully. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what that's going to look like. It's like I said, things have improved, mm -hmm. but um, we're not like friends or anything. I don't know what the final relationship's going to be like after all of this is mm -hmm. over with. But it's just kind of my takeaway is that I need to work on uh, repairing or at least getting this relationship to be healthy, mm -hmm. uh, getting rid of all of the negativity that's, that we've dealt with in the past. And uh, also, you know, uh, making sure that this sort of thing doesn't happen to others uh, and being there to try to repair it as far as I can if it does. Mm -hmm. Good. So you've benefited personally from a third party trying to bring some reconciliation. Mm -hmm. And then you've also seen uh, firsthand um, kind of the hurt that can happen when we don't follow through on these. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Good. That's, That's part of the reason I was getting emotional at the end. Yeah. But, yeah. but you know what? That actually makes it more effective. Mm -hmm. What you just shared, you know, just kind of, it just made it all, it, is anybody else? Yes. Yeah. 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 And all of a sudden I'm thinking, wow. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, <laughs> it touched your life, obviously. Yeah. And that's what makes it powerful for those of us who hear what you have to say as well. And we see that it touches your life. So thank you. It's, it's hard to be transparent. That's actually one of the hardest mm -hmm. things I think about preaching is to be transparent like that. Thank you for being willing yeah. to do that. Mm -hmm. Good job, Jordan. Yeah, good job. Mm -hmm. Your seat's still there, no? <laughs> You get to stand up and teach us. Yes. Yeah, her good. Well, maybe your birthday present is trading notes with her. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> you can have mine. There you go. The book I grabbed instead of the one I showed you. Right so I don't have to be quiet. Okay. So... I don't know why, but I'm more nervous about this than I have been over any talk. And I don't think that um, waiting over four or five days <laughs> helped at all. <laughs> and I feel totally inadequate for the passage that I'm going to talk about. But um, first of all, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just ask that you calm my nerves, Lord, and, and let me get behind you, Lord so that you can speak your word, and um, it will be clear, concise, and accurate to what mm -hmm. you wanted to, to be said. I see these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so my question here is, who would you like to be? Who do you want to be like, I should say? Who is your hero? Is it a... Um, a musician, for those of you that play or sing, is it? Do you want to be on um, American Idol and and be that top star, or um, do you want to? Um, I say it's a sports. Got some sports people in here, a basketball player. You know, there's a lot of training that goes involved. That's involved in that. But you know, who do you look up to, and who are you following? You know, trying to be like. Um, uh, there was, um, in Ephesus, you had a port city and it's a lot of tourist attractions. And there is, you'd come into the port and there's this big thoroughfare that would lead to the temple or to the theater. 
and with with gymnasiums and baths and you know all the lodgings and things like that on the uh, side and and there was probably um, athletes that were there there was probably actors um, there was probably um, you know all of those things that that the people in Ephesus probably also thought I want to be like them I want to do that and um, so there was a lot of people that they could follow too and um, so let's go to the Bible and let's see some of the things that they're said here of who we should be following so I'm in Ephesians 5 1 through 14 we've got be imitators of God therefore as dearly loved children and live a life of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God but among you there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people nor should there be obscenity foolish talk or coarse joking which are out of place rather um, thanksgiving for of this you can be sure no immoral impure or greedy person such as a man is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God let no one deceive you with empty words for because of such things God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient therefore do not be partners with them for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is a sh shameful, it is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, for it is light that makes everything visible. This is why it is said, Wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. So, we're going to see that our times have not changed very much. And the message that Paul was given to the Ephesians, which are the believers of that time, that both the Gentiles and the the um, the Jewish people that it's it's still relevant today. Um, verse one starts with therefore, which means that we need to look to the previous verses. And Jordan did a very good job about how we are supposed to behave as as the body of Christ and how we're supposed to put away all of the the anger and the the um, you know. Uh, we're supposed to be kind to one another, tender-hearted, and forgiving each other. And our example for that is just as God in Christ also has forgiven us. Um, Jesus, during his his mission, you know, during his time on um, on the earth, was compassionate to the blind, to the sick, to the lost, and in love he offered his life as an offering that became a fragrant aroma to God. And when you, you know, we can all think of fragrance as, you know, for me, it's that cinnamon candle at Christmas time. And you come into the room and, oh, it just smells so good. And I just love that. And when I think of that, as far as, you know, what Christ did for us was this fragrant fragrant aroma to God that was pleasing to God. Um, so then we go on to, to verse, verse uh, 3 through about verse 6 where it gives us a list of things that are not part of God. Um, you know, you're not going to find anywhere in the scriptures where it says that God was immoral or that he was greedy, or, or anything. These are things that were part of the, um, the, the um, 
culture or the ethnic of, of the people in Ephesus. It's a port city. It's like a Heinz 57 um, melting pot. And, you know, um, in some of my research, I was surprised to find out that the, the process when they would come to, when people would come to the city, the custom was that they would um, go to the temple and they would offer a, um, a Thanksgiving offering for, to the gods for safe passage through the seas. And it didn't, it, it was okay if it wasn't specifically to the goddess Diana because there was a, an area in the temple that had several different idols. So as long as your god didn't cause any problems and didn't become, you know, too judgmental or too strict on their practices, it, it was fine to be there. And so you could come from a different, um, with a different god and you could still give thanksgiving in the temple. And um, so, um, a lot of this was, was still apparent in the, the um, Gentiles where they needed to not even have a hint of this. So go back to those, that long thoroughfare where you've got the businesses that are selling the little idols. Well, okay, so is that a good thing to do or is that a bad thing to do? Is it an okay thing to do as a, as a believer to make a profit off of the gods? It looks like it's pretty specific here. God says that, that in, um, let's see, I think it's in verse 6, where it says, or 5, For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person such a man is an idol idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. So let no one deceive you that, um, that it's okay to do this. You can do this little bit, you know, and oh, that's all right, that's acceptable. But don't, don't be deceived that that is part of what God says is not right. So let's move on to... Um, verse um, 7 through 11, it, it goes into uh, a description of what another thing what Jordan brought out was the old self and the, the new self. It says you were once darkness, and darkness means blindness, or it's, um, it's a, um, let's see, it's a, um, a, an ignorance to the things of God. And so once you were like that, but, but now you have accepted Christ into your life. You're, you're a believer. You have been forgiven of your sins. And so now you have this new self, this new self that's being transformed. And um, out of that new self, you've got um, the things that are to be imitated, and that is all goodness and righteousness and truth. And goodness is your uprightness of heart and life. It should be shown in your life. And rightness is the condition acceptable to God, integrity, virtue, um, purity of life, rightness and correctness of thinking, it's how you feel and act towards other people. And it's the truth. The truth is the, the true notions of God, which are open to human reason without supernatural intervention. It's your duties, your moral and religious duties. Um, in our actions to others, we're to be kind and compassionate, just as Christ was, and forgiving as we have been forgiven by the measure that Christ Jesus love does, which is a sacrificial love. So Ephesians 5.8 talks about the believer's previous condition of being in darkness. And, um, and, but that's the past, and we need to go to what's now. 
and um, and make sure that we're always trying to find out what pleases God. I really love that part where it says, um, you know, in verse 10, and find out what pleases the Lord. It says, how are we going to find out what pleases the Lord unless we're in his word? You know, that is, that is something that, as a believer, we really need to, to be in his word. Um, then it goes on a little bit to, in... Um, uh, chapter or verse 11 where it says have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness there again it's you know um, you're not even supposed to speak about what the disobedient do in um, in the the secret uh, when I looked at speak I just thought you know when I read that verse I've always read it as you know okay we're not supposed to talk about you know all these you know, shady things or whatever. We're not supposed to talk about those. But what it says at, for speak uh, was really interesting to me. It's to teach. We're not supposed to teach about what is done in secret, what the disobedient do. And um, um, that was it for that. Um, and so then, you know, We've got your old self, we've got the new self, and the process in there is the transformation. And as we're learning to, to look at what pleases the Lord, we take on that transformation where the Holy Spirit is working in us and through us, and we're producing um, the goodness and, and the, the, um, the fruits that... Um, that in a Christian life, we should be um, proactive and um, um, pleasing the Lord. I'm getting stumbled here. Sorry. So um, this this whole transformation process takes a lifetime, and I know I'm not there. And um, you know, taking these classes. I know that I'm on the right path, and um, there will be a day when, when you know, I may see fruit. But even if I don't see fruit, as long as I'm with the Lord and I'm I'm on that path, and I'm I'm, you know, have put off the old self. Every time it sneaks up, you know, I've got to put it off and and put on that new self. Remember who I am following. And so your, um, your question might be, if it takes a lifetime, you know, wh why do we wor worry about it now? I'm still young. I have a long time to, to worry about that. You know, I can just be fine just going to church and, and doing my own thing. And, and, you know, maybe I watch all those bad movies. Maybe I, you know, should be doing... Uh, visiting somebody when I'm, you know, sitting at home and I want to do I, I, I. You know, we need to see what pleases the Lord. Mm. And um, so if we look to verse 13, it says, But everything exposed by the light becomes visible. For it is the light that makes everything visible. That is why it is said, Wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. The, the light is Christ. And, you know, on that day when he says, Wake up, you know, um, O sleeper, sleeper, that was another word that, um, that meant, Do not disregard your salvation. Don't think lightly of it. This is an important thing. And you need to keep continuing on. This is kind of one of those, those passages where there's a lot of hope, but there's a lot of, it feels like there's a lot of fingers being pointed. But remember, I'm pointing them back at myself too. You know, um, wake up, O oh sleeper. 
rise up from the dead, get off the pew, you know, get out there. Christ will shine on everything. Nothing will be hidden on that day. Nothing will be hidden. For me, I want to sweep out all those cobwebs. I want to be forgiven from all of those. I want to be washed clean. I want to be white as snow. And that's the path that I'm on. And I just encourage you to come on that path with me. And let's, let's know that when we get to that day, we'll be able to stand. That's it. Good, good. Anybody have any uh, questions? Yeah, will you marry me? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right now, right here. <laughs> Wait, do we have a minister to do the wedding? <laughs> we got a couple. Let's see. So uh, the quote in verse 14, mm -hmm. where'd that come from? When you, when he, that's a good it? question. I couldn't, I couldn't, um, I remember seeing it, mm -hmm. um, but I don't, I didn't write, I might have wrote it down in my other, um, it was said in several different places, I remember that, mm -hmm. and it was not necessarily word for word here, right. um, but it was in several different places. Mm -hmm. In the Old Testament, um, awake, awake, mm -hmm. yeah. Right. And, and how, does it, how did, when you were doing the study of the passage, how did it occur to you that Paul was using that quote? Um, I felt that it was in the personal life okay. that um, it was it you know it had some reference to or it had some feel to um, future when Christ was going to come back but I also thought that it was it was a lot to the personal believer you know mm -hmm. to wake up and and you know it does make a difference the mm -hmm. way you live your life makes a difference mm -hmm. and. Um, you can't do these things in secret anymore. You can't, you have to, you have to realize. And that was the other thing with, with don't be deceived mm -hmm. that it, it doesn't matter because it does. Yeah, it doesn't matter. So how did you answer your question that you posed at the front? Who do you want to be like? Who do you want to admire? Mm. I want to be like Jesus. Mm -hmm. That's who I want to, I want, that's who I admire. Mm -hmm. um, that's who I want to uh, strive to be more like in this what, transformation. What, what touched you personally more in this passage? Was it the, uh, the negative examples to avoid in 3 through 6 or more the kind of positive idea of, you know, you, you've, got this, you've got this model to follow. I mean, mm -hmm. I guess everybody is motivated either you know, it's the carrot or the stick, really, or the two kind of things. What, for you, was was more persuasive in terms, for your particular viewpoint of the Christian life, is the carrot more persuasive or the or the stick more persuasive? For me, it's the carrot. It is it, the carrot. It definitely is the carrot. The, um, the, um, I'm a pretty simple person, and I, I don't see, maybe I should see, Mm -hmm. other things uh, you know but I don't see greed I don't mm -hmm. see I don't see the uh, impurities mm -hmm. um, uh, I do see a lot of of love and I do see a lot of um, caring mm -hmm. kindness um, and that's what I want more of right. good yeah. excellent yeah. anyone else anything you want to comment or anything mm -hmm. oh. I think it's time for a party, actually. <laughs> yeah, so let's have a party.
I'm down to two bars. Okay, so Ellen, I gave you a copy of the notes that we started uh, last time and didn't get done. So we're going to pick up that again. Uh, what I'm going to do, just so that you'll know, I'm going to, uh, I realize that uh, this format is not going to serve you as well as it might, so I'm going to change uh, the format of the lectures. That won't have any impact on your assignments, but I want to uh, spend a little more time on sermon structure because it's a different kind of structure. Um, if you're thinking that what you just did was a sermon structure, it wasn't a sermon structure. It was, it was a, a, a lesson. pointer. Yes. Uh, my, my pointer. Oh, I can't see it. Oh, it's over there someplace. Um, so, in your notes on the second page, this is where we left off. We started this last time. So, uh, we're looking at uh, expository preaching or exposition in the Old Testament. And uh, we just started, finished this, this was a slide we closed on. We looked at a couple of examples from Lamech, from Melchizedek, from Noah, and from Jacob. And we had looked at those particular slides. So let's focus on, on really where things begin to come together, which is for Moses. Um, this is a summary slide. So it's at the bottom on page two on your notes. So uh, the, the failure of Modus, Moses, if you will, is that uh, uh, Moses focused really, in, instead of speaking, he focused more on uh, action. Turn to Exodus chapter 2. You have it on the bottom of page 2 there. Exodus chapter 2. Exodus 2, 11 and 12. Uh, if we're going to point to a uh, failure by Moses, this is where it begins. Uh, you, you all know the story of Moses, how he was saved in a miraculous way when Pharaoh was trying to kill the male babies. But uh, verse 11 and 12 of Exodus chapter 2. Um, go ahead, Jordan, you're there. If you would, uh, 11 and 12. And it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown, that he went out to his brethren and looked uh, on their burdens. And he spied an Egyptian smiting a Hebrew, uh, one of his brethren. And he looked this way and that way. And when he saw that there was no one, uh, you know, no one watching, he slew the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. Yeah, and then, uh, so he's called on, jumped down the next four, 14, skip 13, 14. Well, go ahead and read, Jordan. And he, and he said, Who made you prince and a judge over us? Uh, do you intend to kill me as you killed that Egyptian? And Moses feared and said, Surely this thing is known. Yeah. So the, the question there is interesting because we're going to get to where does Moses' authority come from? And uh, this, this Hebrew, we skipped verse 13, so he goes out the next day and there's two, two Hebrews fighting and and he says, don't do that. So then their question is, who made you a prince or a judge over us? You know, we actually have a, a, a kind of a, a tongue-in-cheek way that we apply that to people who would stand in judgment over us. You know, who, who made you my daddy or my mommy or whatever it would be? And, uh, but in this case, it's, the question is, who gave you the authority to speak to us? And what's interesting is to consider this this little vignette in Moses' life in light of this question. Was Moses 
called at this point? No, he had not been called of the Lord yet at this point. Um, that came a little bit later. And it came at the burning bush. Turn to the next chapter, chapter 3. Let's uh, read 3, 4 through 12. This is a significant portion. Are you, are you in a good reading mood, Jordan? Okay. 4 through 12. Okay. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, uh, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And he said, uh, Draw not nigh hither. Draw, oh, do not come close. Uh, put, put off your shoes from your feet, for the place you're standing is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people, which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their, of their taskmasters. For I know their sorrows. And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of the land to a good land, and a, and a large, uh, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to a place where the, to the place of the Canaanites, and the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is come to me, and I have, I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh, and that you may bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, Certainly I will be with you, and this shall be a token unto you, that I have sent you. When you have brought forth the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God upon this mountain. Okay. Different than the earlier story about Moses, notice verse 10, particularly uh, there in chapter 3. God speaking, he says, Therefore, come now, and I will send you to Pharaoh. Earlier, the Hebrew had said, Well, who are you? Who made you our judge? Who made you our deliverer? Well, now Moses receives that call. And uh, God is the one who sends him. And then down in verse 14, we looked at this extensively back in Bibliology. Uh, here is Moses' message. Uh, God said to Moses, I am who I am. You know, earlier in verse 13, Lord, I, I'm going to go to the sons. I'm going to say to them, the God of your father has sent me now. They may say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? Notice how many times the, the repetition of the words say, speak. Okay, verse 14, God answers Moses and he says, I am who I am. He said, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. We have both uh, the, uh, the content of the message and how it's supposed to be delivered. Don't write on a rock. Say to the people, I am that I am has sent me. And then notice further uh, the authority over the people, the elders and the Pharaoh. Look at verses 13 and four, excuse me, uh, yeah, 15 and 16. Um, go ahead, Karen, if you read 15 and 16. Got you with the straw in your mouth. That's okay. And God also said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name by which I am to be remembered from generation to generation. Um, Go assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, appeared to me and said, I have watched over you and have seen what has been done to you in Egypt. Okay, verse 15, say to the sons of Israel, say to the people. Verse 16, say to the elders, speak to the elders, okay? And uh, so he's called, he's given a message. Verse 14, tell them I am that I am sent you and speak both to the people and to the elders. Uh, we have the spoken message before we have the written message. 
Writing is secondary. And so there's that message that was so important. And, and really, Moses only has one message. Uh, it's the content. His content is reveal God and then expand on his will. So it's God's person and God's will. God's person is, I am that I am. God's will, look at verse 18. And they will pay heed to what you say, and you, will, and, and you with the elders of Israel will come to the king of Egypt and will say to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, has met with us, so now please let us go a three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. God's person, I am that I am. God's will, let my people go. Very simple message. That was Moses' message. But really, if you will, this is kind of the, the fountain head, the, the spring from which all other preaching really has its source is right here. And all preaching today still has those two basic components. Who is God? The revelation of God, we have it in his word. What is God's will? How to live in such a way that God is pleased. God's person, God's will. Same message that Moses had, that's really the, the same message that every preacher of God's word has had. That same component. So, revelation, who is God, exposition, um, what God says. And so, uh, after Moses, the latter, and not so much the former, uh, who God is hasn't changed. I mean, people need, still need to hear who God is, and that God has revealed himself specifically in his son Jesus Christ. We'll look at that more when we get into a consideration of the New Testament and expository preaching. But uh, in, in terms of these two dynamics, revelation of who God is and then uh, what God's message is to man, uh, we focus more on probably the latter than the former uh, in these times. But God wasn't done with Moses in terms of uh, how he used Moses He instituted three, the three primary offices, if you will, uh, in the Old Testament. So in your notes, I'm on uh, page 4, Deuteronomy. Um, let's, we'll, Deuteronomy 18, we'll start with that. We'll be spending quite a bit of time in Deuteronomy 18, actually. Let's read Deuteronomy 18, and we'll start at verse 15 and go down through verse 18. <coughs> yeah, go ahead, Amanda, if you would, 15 to 18. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your countrymen. You shall listen to him. This is according to all that you asked of the Lord your God in Horeb on the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God. Let me not see this great fire anymore, or I will die. The Lord said to me, They have spoken well. I will raise up a prophet from among their countrymen like you, and I will put my words in his mouth. And he shall speak to them all that I command him. Okay, now look closely at verse 16. Notice what happens in verse 16. Um, this is from a little earlier in their history. This is according to, so this is Moses speaking to the people. Verse 15, I will raise up a prophet like you. Now, uh, we understand this to, you know, prophet with a capital P. All right, Jesus Christ. But it doesn't limit it to that. As we know, it's actually, it foretells that he will actually raise up a number of prophets. But notice why he's raising up prophets. Look what verse 16 says. This is according to all that you asked the Lord your God in Horeb on the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, nor let me see this great fire anymore, lest I die. In other words, send someone that will tell us what God wants rather than having God speak to us directly. It's too terrifying. It is too intimidating to, to see the presence of God and the fire and the, and, the, and the ground shaking and all that they were exposed to. And they said, Lord, in the future, we will hear you, but we'll hear you from another human, not directly. Speak to your prophets and have your prophets speak to your people. And that's the pattern then that develops through the rest of the Bible and on into the New Testament era. Um, God spoke directly to his prophets in the Old Testament. Uh, God speaks to his preachers, those who, those who speak in the office of a prophet or as one who proclaims, thus saith the Lord, he now speaks to those, the, the New Testament preacher through the, new, through the word of God. And we also have here in Deuteronomy, as it says on your notes, the, the, 
the prophets are instituted there. We read that in Deuteronomy 18. Uh, go back a, a chapter to 17, 14. Uh, we, we have a mention of not only the prophet, but a king and a priest as well. Uh, Moses was really the uh, out of the chute. He, he, was, uh, he spoke through his prophet Moses to establish all three offices. So uh, we just read about the prophet in Deuteronomy 18, 15. Deuteronomy 17, 14. Are you there, Erlen? Do you read 17, 14, please? When you enter the land which the Lord your God gives you, and you possess it and live in it, and you, you say, I will set a king over me like all the nations who are around me. In 15 as well. You shall surely set a king over you whom the Lord your God chooses, one from among your countrymen who shall set as king over yourselves. You may not put a foreigner over yourselves who is not your countryman. And then jump down to verse 18 and just read uh, uh, 1, 2, and 3, if you would. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. Please. I, th I thought you meant the other. Um, the, Levitical, the Levitical priest, the whole tribe of Levi, shall have no portion or inheritance with Israel. They shall eat the Lord's offerings by fire and his portions. They shall have no inheritance among their countrymen. The Lord is their inheritance, as he promised them. Now this shall be the priest's due from the people, from those who offer a sacrifice, either an ox or a sheep, of which they shall give to the priest the shoulder and the two cheeks and the stomach. Okay. So uh, through the prophet Moses, we have the office of prophet, priest, and king. Uh, all given, you know, the Mosaic law, that's why... That's why the Mosaic Law is so foundational. So much of what we have it started with the Mosaic Law. It's almost like, if you will, the, the book of Genesis in terms of... Uh, in Genesis, God speaks everything into being. In, uh, in, in Moses, God speaks through his prophet and begins to speak to the people that he spoke into being. Um, mostly because of uh, verse 16, which we saw earlier, um, that authorized in place of direct speech from God... Uh, but there's some accountability that's in the same passage. So we're still in Deuteronomy 18. And uh, uh, go ahead, man, read 18 uh, in terms of the, uh, the accountability. Notice what it says. I will raise up a prophet from among their countrymen like you, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. So what's Moses' accountability? In what way, what area is God going to hold him accountable? He has to speak like God. He has to speak my words. Okay? That's his accountability. But, no, so go on in verse uh, 20, Amanda. But the prophet who speaks a word presumptuously in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or which he speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. So he has an accountability to speak God's words, but he, he also has a, a limit. He cannot go beyond God's words. He can't speak beyond what God... Uh, calls him to. Um, and then uh, we saw in 18 uh, where the, the Lord uh, calls the nation and, uh, and, and he will command the nation. Uh, there's, there's some very interesting uh, examples in here. Um, let, let's look up the, turn to uh, second, 1 Kings 13. This is one of those very strange passages in Scripture. 1 Kings 13. Uh, Mark, would you read 1 through 6, please? 1 Kings 13. Okay. Now behold, there came a man of God from Judah to Bethel by the word of the Lord, while Jeroboam Jer was standing by the altar to burn incense. He cried against the altar by the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus says the Lord, Behold, a son shall be born to the house of David, Josiah by name, and on you he shall sacrifice the priest of the high places who burn incense on you, and human bones shall be burned on you. Then he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is a sign which the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be split apart, and the ashes from the ashes which are on it shall be poured out. Now when the king heard the saying of the man of God, which he, cr which he cried against the altar in Bethel, Jeroboam stretched out his hand from the altar, saying, Seize him. 
but his hand which he stretched out against him dried up so that he could not draw it back to himself. How far? Five. Five. The altar also was split apart and the ashes were poured out from the altar according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. Okay, so we don't know the prophet's name. Verse 1 just says a man of God from Judah. Uh, we, don't know, we don't know his name. But uh, he's given a prophecy. He cries against the altar. It says, O altar, altar, verse 2, a son shall be born in the house of David, Josiah by name. And uh, on you, speaking of the altar, on this altar shall be sacrificed the priests of the high places, and human bones shall be burned on you. Uh, Jeroboam didn't like that, and so he was going to uh, have, have the prophet seize, and he sticks his arm out in verse 4, and uh, his hand stretches out and it dries up so that he couldn't draw it back to him. I don't know what that looked like, but it must have been really freaky. And then the altar split apart, verse 5, where the ashes were poured out from the altar according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. He speaks ac accurately for the Lord, and exactly what he says happens is going to happen. Mark, go ahead and read uh, 6 through 10. The king said to the man of God, Please entreat the Lord your God and pray for me that my hand may be restored to me. So the man of God entreated the Lord, and the king's hand was restored to him, and it became as it was before. Then the king said to the man of God, Come home with me and refresh yourself, and I will give you a reward. But the man of God said to the king, If you were to give me half your house, I would not go with you, nor would I eat bread or drink water in this place. For so it was commanded me by the word of the Lord, saying, You shall eat no bread, nor drink water, nor return by the way which you came. So he went another way and did not return by the way which he came to Bethel. Okay, so the prophet is given some specific commands for himself. Uh, the king said to the man of God, Come home with me and refresh yourself. The man of God, verse 8 says, It wouldn't matter if you gave me half your house, I wouldn't go with you nor eat bread. For so, verse 9, it was commanded me by the word of the Lord. You shall eat nor bread nor drink water nor return by the way which you came. So he went another way, and everything's looking good at this point. And then, uh, verse 11. Verse, read 11 through 19, if you would, Mark. Now an old prophet was living in Bethel, and his sons came and told him all the deeds which the man of God had done that day in Bethel, the words which he had spoken to the king. There also they related to their father. Their father said to them, Which way did he go? Now his sons had seen the way which the man of, of God had came from Judah and had gone. Then he said to his sons, Saddle the donkey for me. So they saddled the donkey for him and rode away on it. So he went after the man of God and found him sitting under an oak. And he said to him, Are you the man of God who came from Judah? And he said, I am. Then he said to them, Come home with me and eat bread. He said, I cannot return with you, nor go with you, nor will I eat bread or drink water with you in this place. For a command came to me by the word of the Lord, You shall eat no bread, nor drink water, nor do not return by going the way which you came. He said to him, I, am, I also am a prophet like you, and an angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with you to, drink, uh, to your house, that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied to him. So he went back with him and ate bread in his house and drank water. Okay. Um, so we have a true prophet who knew what the Lord said to him. Don't eat, don't drink, don't go back by the same way. Another prophet who is a false prophet, because at the end of verse 18 it says, the Lord spoke to me and it says he lied. He says, nope, nope, I got another message for you. Come home with me. We'll have a meal together. Um, and... Uh, What's interesting is that he goes home with the man. Go ahead, Mark, and read 20 and 21. Now it came about, as they were sitting down at the table, that the word of the Lord came to the prophet who had brought him back. And he cried to the man of God who came from Judah, saying, Thus says the Lord, because you have disobeyed the command of the Lord and have not observed the commandment which the Lord your God commanded you, but have returned and eaten bread and drank water in the place for which he said to, to you, Eat no bread or drink no water. Your body shall not come, shall not come to the grave of your fathers. Just read the next two verses, twenty-three. It came about after he had eaten bread and after he had drank that he saddled the donkey for him for the prophet whom he had brought back. Now when he had gone, a lion met him on the way and killed him, and his body was thrown on the road with with the donkey standing beside it. The lion was also standing beside the body. Okay, 
do we learn anything from this very strange account? The prophet was told to go and speak to the king. It was a risky business to speak to the king and tell the king that, you know, this altar does not honor the Lord and it's going to split in two and ashes of humans are, human bones are going to be burned on it. And the king starts to defy the prophet and the king's hand shrivels up. And the prophet had received from the word personal instructions as well. Don't go back the same way, don't eat, don't drink. And then a false prophet comes and tells the, the first prophet a different message. So he goes against that and he is held accountable. On the one hand, he was faithful in proclaiming the message that God gave him to proclaim to the king. On the other hand, in his personal life, if you will, he's done proclaiming the message, he's delivered what he was supposed to deliver, and now he's just going to go home. But he gets sidetracked when the Lord said, don't get sidetracked. And he sat down for a meal, the Lord said he shouldn't be eating, and shouldn't be drinking. And for that, he's judged. What do we learn from that scenario? Listen to God, not other people. Good. Mm -hmm. It's possible to speak for the Lord and still be held accountable for issues in our own lives that are unrelated to the message that we've just spoken. In other words, just because we're God's spokesman in a particular setting doesn't mean that we no longer have to obey the word of the Lord personally for ourselves. As a matter of fact, the two are connected. Like Baxter, what, what are you referring to? Oh, the, the Baxter that wrote in the sixteen hundreds mm -hmm. when you know he his his message to his preachers that you, you can preach the word, you can deliver the knowledge and the message, but you better be you're going to be held accountable if you're not living it. Because he had a lot of pastors then that were hired by the state, mm -hmm. and they went and preached, but they didn't even live it. So they, they, a lot of them weren't even they weren't saved themselves, right. but so they were. Yeah. The the other the other. Uh, dynamic that, that we see happening in, in this passage is that it is possible for the Lord to speak through a flawed vessel. When you think about it, does he have any other kind of vessel to speak through? He only has flawed vessels to speak through. Every preacher who stands before the people of God and says, thus saith the Lord, is a flawed vessel. That doesn't give us license to disobey the Lord, but it is a reality that we have to recognize. But just because we stand in front of people and, and we have the uh, opportunity, the responsibility to thus saith the Lord in any given passage of scripture that we are exposing or doing our, our message from does not put us in a different category than everyone else in terms of what when it comes to obedience. We must obey the Lord. All of his servants must obey the Lord. Can you say something? I didn't say anything. Oh, no, <laughs> I, thought, I thought you were about to say something. Okay. Um, so the measure of a prophet is the law. Um, in, uh, go, go back to Deuteronomy uh, 18 again. It's such a key passage uh, in this whole discussion. Notice the process that we have here. So, uh, especially verses 19 and 20. Um, go ahead, uh, Nathan, read 19 and 20. <coughs> it shall come about that whoever will not listen to my words, which he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. But the prophet who speaks a word presumptuously in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or which he speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. Yeah, so uh, we, we kind of went through this, but the idea is that uh, when someone speaks for the Lord, the person hearing the message can't say, well, God, I didn't hear it directly from you. I heard it through this flawed vessel of yours. Therefore, I'm, I'm off the hook on this one. That's not what he says in verse 19. It said, come to pass, whoever will not listen to my words, which he, the prophet, will speak for my name, I myself will require it of him. But the prophet who shall speak a word presumptuously then has his own accountability. So it's that, that, that double dynamic. Um, let's look at an example of this. It's uh, Jeremiah 26. Uh, we can I'm just read it right here on the screen. Uh, 26, 1 through 6. Who's got good eyes? 
got a book. You want to look at a book instead? Yeah, <laughs> might be easier. First six verses of Jeremiah 26. Go ahead, Karen. Okay. Either way. Either way. In the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, this word came to the Lord, saying, Thus says the Lord, Stand in the court of the Lord's house and speak to all the cities of Judah who have come to worship in the Lord's house all the words that I have commanded you to speak to them. Do not omit a word. Perhaps they will listen and everyone will turn from his evil way, that I may repent of the calamity which I am planning to do to them because of the evil of their deeds. And you will say to them, Thus says the Lord, If I will not listen to if you will not listen to me, to walk in my law which I have set before you, to listen to the words of my servants, the prophets, whom I have been sending to you again and again, but you have not listened, then I will make this house of Shiloh and this city I will make a curse to all the nations of the earth. On the right side of this chart, the, the, the pattern that we see, and that was an example of the pattern from Jeremiah 26, explain Moses' words, give the contemporary setting for those words, call for repentance, call for renewal. We just saw that model in, uh, in uh, Jeremiah 26. Um, so the prophet's manner uh, in your notes uh, on page 6 of your notes the manner delimited means to fix the boundaries or the limits uh, by Moses' law so the manner of the prophet um, so it's from God through Moses explains what God wants relies on speaking on, the, on the, the prophet's part, hearing on the people's part. These are all, it, it seems to go without saying, but I'm going to say it anyway. And then uh, the issue that Mark uh, made mention to, the character, uh, Numbers 12.3. Somebody just go to Numbers 12.3 and read that for us when you get there. Now Moses was very humble, was a very humble man, more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. That's a remarkable statement, mm -hmm. considering that in his generation, Moses was the man the Lord revealed himself to and said, I'm going to speak to my people through you. And, uh, and yet it says right there, the most humble man who ever lived. I am really looking forward to meeting Moses someday. Um, it must have added such power to whatever the Lord wanted him to say because if he was truly the most humble man who ever lived, that was not something that, I mean, that would have been something that everyone would have seen. That this man who speaks for God takes none of God's position in terms of personal pride or, you know, look at me kind of thing, but just, this is what the Lord is saying. And he said it in such a humble way that, he, that that statement could be made. And so the audience an anticipates that God is speaking through his prophet, his man. And, um, you know, the, anyone who uh, declares, thus saith the Lord in the Old Testament, was not speaking his own ideas. He was speaking God's word, and he had the responsibility to speak all of God's word and not add anything to it or take anything away from it. That responsibility has not changed. Um, I'm jumping ahead a little bit here, but when we get to the, the expository preaching, the declaring of thus saith the Lord as we pick up the Bible and we work through a passage, as each of you will do in uh, the preparation for your sermon, um, we have that same responsibility. It's not our ideas. We have no we're way out of, out of place if we stand up in front of people in the pulpit and bring our ideas and put them out there as though it was thus saith the Lord. No, it's what God says. And that's why the 
the exegesis, the digging out of the text, what it really says is so, such an important part of that. We have to craft the sermon. Our exegesis is where we start, and we craft the sermon from that, that initial uh, study in the text, but it's what the text says, not what we bring to the text, not what we like, would like the text to say. It's what the text actually says. And that's key because we see that pattern um, with Moses. Uh, further accountability here had to do with the accuracy. If you, if you can just flip back to Deuteronomy 18 again. Um, let's read uh, 15 down through 22. We'll put it all together and then we'll see the uh, accountability. Amanda, would you read 15 through 22, please? The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your countrymen. You shall listen to him. This is according to all that you asked of the Lord your God in Horeb on the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God. Let me not see the great fire anymore, or I will die. The Lord said to me, They have spoken well. I will raise up a prophet from among them, among their countrymen like you. And I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. It shall come about that whoever will not listen to my words, which he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. But the prophet who speaks a word presumptuously in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or which he speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. You may say in your heart, How will we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not come about or come true, that, that, it, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken, that the prophet has spoken it presumptuously, you shall not be afraid of him. What's implied at the end of verse 22? Turn it around. If the prophet has not spoken presumptuously, be what? You better listen. You, be you better listen. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's not the man that you need to be afraid of, but he's speaking for the Lord. Uh, you know, there's accountability. So there's accountability for the prophet to not go beyond, to declare the full counsel of God. But then those who receive that preaching from the prophet have an accountability as well. And uh, what's what's interesting is that this these uh, words to Moses... Uh, assume some uh, accountability on the part of those who listen to the message as well. Not only that they'll follow through, but they'll be able to discern when it's true and when it's not. And because we have God's Word, that certainly is a, a, a doable kind of thing. Uh, I'm going to kind of jump ahead on your notes here. Can't do it real fast. Um, practice of the prophets, they were preachers first and writers second. Um, I would encourage you to look up uh, 2 Kings 14.25. It's in your notes. It's on uh, the bottom of page 7. Uh, it's interesting that Jonah was a preacher before he was a writer. And that's the point of this. Um, and then, of course, uh, we know that uh, Jonah had uh, prophetic uh, and messianic significance um, Matthew 12, 39, 41, Jesus quotes Jonah. Uh, but I want to just uh, get to this last slide here. Oops, go back. Oops. Oh. Slide at the end of these so it doesn't do that. Come on. One more. Okay. You have it at the top, page eight. We will close with this. God's people have always had expositors, and so we discern a pattern based on certain principles, and, and it's kind of two through uh, six. The prophets were not mystics. They didn't come up with any new material. It was from the Lord. They had a recognized and confirmed call. Um, 
The prophets explained and applied the law of Moses to Israel, including both futuristic statements of consequences, thus saith the Lord, if you don't do this, this is what will happen, and as well as messianic implications beyond the immediate setting, that, that sense of a near fulfillment and a, and a further fulfillment in Jesus Christ. They were preachers first, writers as needed, but they all started out as preachers. And the audience, those who heard the prophets, had a responsibility to hear with the, the idea that they would respond. Um, you know, when we first started this, uh, this look at uh, what's going on with expository preaching, especially in our country, I, I would say that uh, one of the issues that's going on is that last point here. Um, people don't always come to church with the, the expectation that what they hear will be from the Lord and that they will have an accountability before the Lord to have some kind of response in line with the message that they hear. I think often the, the mindset will be something like, well, I wonder what the preacher's got for me today. And then we'll hold it at arm's length and we'll look at it and decide whether or not we want to you know, get on board with whatever the preacher has to say or to think, well, I sure hope so-and-so has listened to that message. <laughs> you ever been there? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because it doesn't have anything to do with me, but it certainly must have something to do with them. Um, they expected audiences to listen as if to God, not about God. That's a very different kind of dynamic. And I would say that if we have lost... I would say that in America, in recent years, we've lost both sides of this. Preachers have uh, often preached a message that is not faithful to the Word of God. It comes from some other source. It sometimes can be their own ideas, or they read a book, or whatever, and they'll put that out there, or something from the newspaper, and rather than just being an illustration to make a point of something from the Scriptures, they'll make the message about whatever the article was and bring in some ideas that may be biblical, maybe not, may be accurately applied, maybe not. But unless you start with the text and then proceed from the text outward, application often misses the point. And, uh, and then that's the preacher's problem. What about the people's problem? They don't always come, I would say, to church saying, I want to hear the Lord speak to the issues in my life. And whatever the Lord has put on this preacher that I'm going to be sitting before on this Sunday morning, I want to hear what the Lord has given this man of God this morning to speak to me personally. And I'm determined that as I walk out of this room, I want to have the Holy Spirit just whack me with whatever it is that the preacher has to say this morning because I believe this man stands there and speaks the words of God and I'm in the audience and he's speaking to me. What do I do with it? So you can see on both sides of this, communication, if you will, that happens on a Sunday morning, there's some responsibility. There's some expectation. There's some understanding that I don't know that's very clearly always brought uh, to the process every Sunday. I know, especially I speak for myself. I mean, most of the time I'm the preacher. But when I'm on vacation or I go someplace else, um, I mean, I, I, know, I know you can ask Russ, but I know this happens that... Uh, you know, because we do this process every week, we're so aware of, aware of the dynamics that sometimes I'm looking at the dynamics and not really listening to the message. I'm aware of basically what we're covering here and just curious to see how it's all going to come together and not, not really focusing on what it is the Lord would speak through this man. And uh, it is, it's an area of sin in my life, and um, the Lord has convicted me about it. And uh, that's not to say that every time you walk into any church, you should assume that the Word of God will be preached. Unfortunately, that is not always the case. So maybe uh, uh, somewhat of a degree of skepticism uh, needs to be there. And that's why we also, 2 Timothy 2.15, need to be those who handle the Word of uh, accurately, not ashamed, as we handle the Word of truth. Um, so, but this, this pattern, these prophetic results, we see it began essentially with Moses. And in Moses, the foundational principles that will carry through the rest of Scripture and right into the New Testament, we'll, we'll see them continue on through that. Any perspective, any comments you want to make at this point? We wrap things up here. I was talking to somebody at church here just last, this last week, and they were talking about church they went to for a while where they said that a lot of times 
the Bible was never open when the preacher preached. So there was nothing that was laid out beforehand. And they said there were sometimes he would actually go up, he wouldn't even take the Bible to the pulpit with him. And, and it was just reminding me of what you're talking about, mm -hmm. that, that they, uh, they said it was very hard to follow or to get anything yeah. out of it because it, it wasn't the word of the Lord. Right. You know, it's a, it's yeah. a pretty solemn charge on both sides yeah. of this communicating God's word. And, and it's solemn from the one who would say, Thus saith the Lord. This is what I honestly think God's word has to say in this text and how it applies to our lives. And solemn on the part of the person that's hearing that as well. That accountability to, before the Lord, respond. Because this process is not something new. It's, it's really the way the Lord kind of set it into motion with Moses, instituted the prophet, gave it the limits, the, the accountability on both sides, and said, that's how I'm going to do it. And it hasn't changed. It hasn't changed. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you. Thank you, Lord, that plan A is your word declared, preached, taught, spoken. And Lord, it, it's, a, it's an amazing responsibility. For Lord, we are clay pots. We are those fallible human beings, and yet you, you declare that you want us to be accountable to you for the way we handle your word, and, and then accountable when given opportunity to share it in a setting where we can say, well, this is what God's word has to say. And of course, Lord, that I can't get away from that statement about Moses in Numbers. The most humble man who ever lived, that's who the Lord chose to be. The, the one who would carry this most important message to his people. And, and, and the ripples go on from that first moment when the Lord said, Moses, I want you to speak for me. Oh, I can't do it, God. No, I, you, you can do it. But these are, these are the, this is the boundary around what you can say. And here's the accountability. And here's, here's what's going to happen if someone goes outside of that. Turns to the people. When this man speaks for me, you must listen, for it's me speaking. Lord, that's pretty solemn, pretty heavy stuff. And Lord, uh, may we all have a, a deeper appreciation for both parts of this dynamic, this process of communicating your word. And Lord, may it just uh, make our, our, our participation in what happens on a Sunday morning just that much richer as uh, we, we realize that God wants to speak to his people. And he uses this flawed person standing in front of the church to do so. And yet, Lord, that is plan A. Wow. Lord, may we be those who not only hear your word, but do your word in this context and in this setting. Lord, take us all home safely tonight. Give us a good weekend, a fruitful weekend, a great weekend to hear your word and respond to it. We ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen.